Okay, welcome back. Let's close the door then. Come okay. okay. More. Uh, well, let's see if you remember where I left you. Who tell me what? Uh, who's gonna tell me what the last thing was that we discussed? So, so the 1956. Right. So let's see what we have discovered so far. We have discovered a few things, right? One is uh, multi-sector model with constant return to scale, right? Uh, describes growth. Okay, that's the von Neumann model. Okay. Yeah. I say describes because if you think it's not a very deep theory. It's a nice model. It's very elegant. It's simple. Mm -hmm. So it has all the characteristic one needs to start thinking about a problem. But it's not a theory. It's a description. Mm -hmm. It says things that have to be true. <laughs> yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. If growth is more income produce more output and output comes from inputs and the technology does not change. So three things. Growth is more output. Output comes from input. Technology does not change. Then there has had to be accumulation of inputs at a certain rate. The other things, irreducibility, growing at the slowest pace of the essential inputs, what's reproducible, what's not reproducible, which factors are essential, which factors are essential, are all logical consequences that you derive by thinking, by deduction, by mathematics, from the formulation. Right? And also the prediction that in a stationary environment with always the same technology, if there is persistent growth, it will probably be at a balanced rate where everything grows more or less at the same rate, is a logical mathematical consequence of the description, right? Now that I notice that I started the lecture by saying, maybe we don't need a theory of growth in the economic sense. That is to say, we don't need a theory, a deep theory of growth, like the growth is due to some magic in the same way that, say, Physicists study gravitational theory, need deep laws, hidden phenomena, have to reconcile the various forces to explain atomic, subatomic structure, and, and right? Maybe growth is complicated <laughs> in its historical manifestation, but simple in its economic feature. And that's actually what I think. I think that growth is fascinatingly complicated as a historical problem because it depends on a lot of things, culture, institution, laws, political decision, nature, blah, blah, blah. But when it takes place, it's always the same thing, <laughs> right? It's always the same thing. And the difference may be speed, for example, right? So the mystery of China growing so fast is, well, it started from very far behind. Ethiopia now is growing very fast, and it started from even far, farther behind. Okay, but when I look at China growth, and I look at Italy growth, and I look at France growth, I look at United States growth, and so on, they all look similar. They all look similar. Mm -hmm. the, the economic characteristics are very similar. So some patterns uh, replicate. Okay, so that's one thing we learn. The second thing we learned was at the aggregate level, this was clear in 
the 1950s. Okay? So that's what we learned from Solo. At art. Okay? So in the 1950s, this is a paper, 1937, and in English in 1940, forgot, 1945, maybe? <coughs> Restart. Right? So obviously this lecture, and then other papers that had been published in the meanwhile, had made people working on growth theory aware of this thing. Mm -hmm. So people were aware that you can grow by reproducing factor and accumulating them at a balance rate along a von Neumann ray or a von Neumann facet, mm -hmm. as they called it. And the aggregate version, the simple aggregate version, was the one in the, you know, footnote five mm -hmm. of Solo, right? Well, the one in which yt is a kt plus b square root of kt. Right? That was just an example. That's just an example. Right? So you found the paper. You found the footnote. You didn't find the footnote in one week? Let me see. I find a footnote for you. It's easy. Relax. <laughs> so year graph. What do you do? You photocopy it wrong. Yeah, you photocopy it wrong. You skip the footnotes. <laughs> no, here it is. Oh, sorry, it's footnote six. Yes, there's six. Six, not five. Six. All right, footnote six. I don't know why I said five. You know, I'm aging. I forget the things I read 30 years ago. Uh, okay, so this we know too. What was the third thing that uh, we thought? What, what's, what's, and Solo says it, and other people say it. Say, say. This describes growth, right? with one reproducible factor and another <coughs> factor L that is not reproducible or reproduces at a very slow pace, right? We also pointed out that one way of thinking at that thing is this. Right? right? This is an isoquant, and the way to interpret here, right? We said, look, it's as if you have very many activities and technologies, right? And you interpolate them in a smooth isoquant. So we pointed out that a proper way of thinking at this is saying, well, when you go from here to here, because capital becomes more abundant and it's cheaper and labor more expensive, maybe it's because you're doing actually technological change. You're changing machine, you're changing production plants, and, uh, and this allows you to substitute labor with capital, okay? So that's where we stopped, okay? So this is where the literature had gone by the 1960s. Is that okay? We can also now try to think a moment about this by putting these things together, right? Because growth without technological change. Right? Mm -hmm. So here growth is just, you know, on a high dimensional surface. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you jump at a rate one plus what I called it, I think gamma, right? Every period. Right? At a balance rate. 
set of inputs, set of outputs, and you just keep going up. Okay? You aggregate, and per se, you could write like that. Right? Notice that AK production function is just an array. <laughs> it's, it's this low dimension, K here, AK here, and that's A. Okay? So it's just a graphical one dimensional representation of. Right? But Solo says, and I think that's why the footnote is relevant, it says something extra. He says, remember that we get, got that from a production function that was like this, which had also labor, right? In fact, a few years later, Solo Arrow uh, Chenery Eifin Dorfman mm -hmm. worked together to derive a class of production function that we have used since called the constant elasticity of substitution production function. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Now the constant elasticity of substitution production function are very nice functional form to represent properties that we think production functions should have because of logical intuitive reasons. Remember that, in general, a constant elasticity production function doesn't need to have only two inputs. It can have as many inputs as you want. Right. Eh? In fact, we write it, in general, as yt equal a, you know, a scale parameter, sorry, a, a unit of measure parameter, times you know, a sum for i equal 1, or maybe, let me write it, little n equal 1 capital N, alpha N, X N, at the power rho, everything raised to the power 1 over rho. Right? Where the alpha N are larger than 0, they add up to 1, so their weights right, that we give to each factor, right? Mm -hmm. And rho that is the key elasticity parameter, is any number larger or equal to minus infinity and less or equal than plus one. Now the mathematician always get <laughs> nervous when we write equal to plus infinity, but we don't care about their purity. We know exactly what we mean, right? right? And we can pass to the limit there and study what happens when rho goes to minus infinity. Mm -hmm. Do you know this? You familiar? We know that with those restrictions, this is a concave, monotone increasing, homogeneous degree one production function, right? And so it's, a representa its representation is a convex con in Rn plus one, where n is the number of inputs and one is the output. All right? We also know that by varying the values of rho, we can obtain a variety of cases. We know that when rho approaches minus infinity, those factors become more and more complementary. Right? The elasticity substitution decreases, and in the limit, there is no substitutability, we get the input output we get, right? Yeah. So rho equal minus infinity is isoquants are like that. Right? Fix. No substitutability at all. We know that for rho negative, we tend to call the factors of production complementary. We know that for rho equal zero, we again we use the L'Hopital rule and derivative to show that the production function has the form a x n of the alpha n uh, multiplied, right? So it's called Douglas, right? It's a multiplication of this, 
right? For rho equals zero. And obviously for rho equal one, it's linear. Where all factors are perfectly produced, replaceable, sorry, substitutable with each other, and then production can be obtained by any factor alone. Okay? Right? You guys follow me? Okay, so we know this from intermediate micro. So now we're going to use this to understand a bit what solar remind and what could be derived from that process. Okay, so well, let's leave it there. So remember what he says in that footnote. Can you read it for me? Six. Yeah, six. The equation of the first might be uh, as, uh, this, is, this is the equation. <laughs> You do. <laughs> Don't get embarrassed. He says, in figure three are shown two possibilities, right? So this one, the NR and, and the one, uh, together with a ray NR, that is NK here. Both have diminishing marginal productivity throughout, and one lies wholly above NR, 